Hello, hello everyone, and well, thank you for coming to today's event. Um, just a quick note before we start. Um, if you're here for the Roseanne Brown event, it's actually downstairs in the children and teens section of the store. But if you're here for the AM Homes event, you're in the right place. Um, so hello and welcome to Politics and Pros Bookstore. Um, my name is Olivia Marquis. I'm part of the event staff here at Politics and Pros, where we now host in-person and virtual events, along with partnered and supported events, trips, and classes. For a full list of everything confirmed, please go to our website, politics-pros.com. Before we get started today, I'd like, to at, I'd like to ask you to silence your cell phones so as not to disrupt the event. While we've listed, lifted the mask mandate here in the store, you're encouraged to wear a mask throughout the event and we can provide one for you at the front if you did not bring one. When we get to the time for opening the floor to your questions, we've placed a standing microphone at the end of the aisle to your right. Please line up at one of these mics so everyone can hear your, hear your question and we want that question to be heard in our recording of the event as well. We are both audio and video recording or live streaming today's program so that you or anyone you know can find it at the Politics and Pros YouTube channel. Following the event, we'll have a signing right here up at this table. So if you have not yet purchased the book, we have many copies behind our registers at the front of the store. We'll ask you to line up starting at that pillar right there where the microphone is. Um, and we will come by and ask your name for personalization. So please have your books ready for us. Once the event is complete, we ask that you fold up your chairs, lean them against something sturdy to help us out a little bit. So now without further ado, Tonight, I'm very excited to welcome A.M. Holmes, celebrating the release of The Unfolding, a novel that explores dyna dynamics within a family, the desire for those in power to remain in power, the current rift in American identity, and the explosive consequences of what happens when the words truth, freedom, and democracy mean such different things to people living under the same roof. A.M. Holmes sorry, is the author of 13 books, among them the best-selling memoir, the Mistress's Daughter, the novels This Book Will Save Your Life, The End of Alice and Jack, and the short story collections Days of Awe, The Safety of Objects and Things You Should Know. You should also, oh, sorry. <laughs> she also writes for film and television and teaches in the creative writing program at Princeton University. Please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, A.M. Holmes. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Hello, family and friends. <laughs> um, it's a treat to be back in the, in the hometown uh, bookstore uh, and to see people who I've known for all of my life. Mom, both eyes open. <laughs> um, um, exactly. So I'm going to, the book just came out yesterday. Um, so I'm, I was like, wait, I'm getting a message. Excuse me. No. Um, so I'm going to, tell you a little bit about sort of what prompted this book and then I'm going to read a little bit and then I will happily answer questions about anything, things I might know answers to, things I could just make up answers to because I am after all fiction writer. Um, so this is a book called The Unfolding and it took a very long time to write because the world kept changing. I was like, wait, what? Um, so probably like 10 years ago, really long time ago, I said to my editor, I feel like there's something weird happening in the world and like the sort of the political establishment has lost touch with the average American, and there's this new thing called dark money that seems to be kind of seeping into the political system, and I want to write a novel about it. And the editor looked at me and says, you don't write science fiction. And I said, well, I just have this weird feeling. And they seemed thoroughly uninterested in the idea. So I kind of, I didn't shelve it, but I didn't make it a top priority. And I did write this one short story that's in the last book about a man who was shopping at a Costco store, big box store as they call them, and while he's in there, he's, his child finds a baby that's been left on a shelf, and they're like, can we keep it? And all these crazy things happen, and he's nominated by the shoppers in the store to run for president, because they feel like he can represent them very well. And so I, on the one hand, the other, my, one of my other editors is like, that should be a novel. And I was like, well, I have other, I have other darker ideas. And then uh, this man named Donald Trump was elected, and the editor called me and goes, where's the book? And I was like, you didn't say you wanted it. So. Anyway, so that brings us pretty much up to here. And then I will say that because uh, the book in some ways, um, sort of even though it takes place from 2008 to the very beginning of 2009, 
a little bit predicts the events of January 6th. And so then some people have said, well, did you write it since January 6th? I thought, if only. I mean, it takes forever to write a book, and then publishing takes an extra year, so no. But people said to me, it's really good your book didn't come out before that because you'd be in trouble. So, so that brings us to where we are today. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to read to you a little bit. This is a sort of edited version from the beginning, and then I'll read to you for a little bit further in. These are, these are new probably since the last time I saw you. Um, now you're all blurry. Okay. <laughs> the Unfolding. Wednesday, November 5th, 2008. The Biltmore Hotel, second floor bar, Phoenix, Arizona. 1 a.m. This can't happen here. He's been at the bar for 90 minutes. A dozen men have come and gone, having drowned their sorrows, done a little business, and put the whole thing to bed. There are four whiskey glasses in front of him, each one different, none of them empty. In one corner, the television is on, volume down. The talking head postmortem will go all night. In the other corner, by the window, there's a couple canoodling like there's no tomorrow. And in the middle of the bar, a screwball with a Zippo lighter runs his thumb over the wheel again and again, scratching the flint to spark. Windproof, he says, each time the fuel ignites. Windproof. It's on me as much as anyone, the big guy says to the bartender. Humility, if nothing else, requires that a man take responsibility for his failures. You sound like a man pleading guilty, the bartender says. The big guy shakes his head. All men make mistakes, but making the same mistake twice is not a mistake. It's a pattern. Tonight it was like Fat Man and Little Boy got together again and planted a mushroom garden right here in Phoenix. And yet somehow we're surrounded by folks who have no idea what they brought upon themselves. No idea. A man slides into the seat next to the big guy, glances at the four glasses of whiskey, and signals, signals the bartender. Pour me one of those, he says. Which one? The one in the middle. There is no middle, the bartender says. The Highland Park. The big guy looks up. You can call it in the dark? Salanche, the man says, knocking back the drink. You're not one of them, are you? The big guy asks. One of what? Your hair is wet, so I'm thinking you're one of the assholes who got up and sprayed champagne and did a little victory dance a couple of hours ago. I don't think so, the man says. I'm more like a fella who came downstairs and took a dip in the pool in order to clear my head. Explains the smell, the big guy says. Chlorine. The man taps the glass for the bartender. Again. Were you in the room upstairs? I was, the man says. And what did you see, the big guy asks. A generational earthquake that split the terra firma. The big guy snorts. I would characterize it as a heavy metal Led Zeppelin, a grim shaking of the head, the palsied all too knowing dip of disappointment, keening women knowing they'll have crushed male egos to deal with for breakfast, the damp, dull face of defeat. They banked on the wrong horse in the absence of a better horse, while full well knowing it wasn't even a horse race, but really a rat race. Please tell me you're not a reporter, the big guy says. Historian, sometimes professor, occasional author, but not on the clock tonight. If you're not on the clock, why are you here? Bearing witness, the man suggests, fellow traveler. The big guy flags the bartender. Give him the Ardberg. It's one of my favorites. I call it Santa's Paws. It tastes like it crawled out of the fireplace. Smoky. They should just burn it down, the screwball with the Zippo says, flipping his lighter to the gun position and letting the flame go high and then slapping the lighter closed. The bartender goes over and asks the screwball to settle his tab. It's a been a long night for everyone, he says. Time to go home. There's no place like home, Zippo says, standing up. I'm going to leave. That's the beginning, the very beginning. And now, skipping forward. So this book, one of the things about it that's a little, I don't want to say weird, but I could say unusual, is that in a way it is a braided narrative. So there's this story of the big guy and what comes to be his sort of cohort called the Forever Men, who are a bunch of men who believe that when Obama was elected, something very wrong happened and they're very upset, and they feel like they've lost control of the Republican Party, and they want to find a way to reclaim their vision of democracy over a long period of time that could look a little bit like where we are now. Um, so, yeah, exactly. And then the second piece of the braid is the story about the big guy's daughter, Megan, who votes for the first time in 2008, and begins to realize that things are not what she thought they were, and the way that she's sort of been indoctrinated into this very conservative family, and with a certain set of values may not be how she, she sees the world. And so she and her mother, Charlotte, each sort of have their own kind of coming to consciousness during the course of the book. So the section I'm going to read now is a part where the, she, the girl, Megan, has flown home from a school much like Madeira in Virginia, 
where she's in boarding school, and she's flown home to Wyoming to vote for the first time. And so she's with her parents, and that weird thing when you've been away from home and you go home, and all of a sudden things seem a little different. Like today, when I came home. <laughs> um, I'm like, wait, where am I? Nightmare or dream? No, I'm always the comedian. Okay. <laughs> We're, we're having commentary in the front row. <laughs> That's okay, I like it. All right, so this is uh, sort of still in the very early part of the book, okay? Her mother and father are the only people who got dressed up. Her father is wearing a camel hair top coat over his suit. He skipped the tie, but she has no doubt it's in his pocket just in case. Her mother is wearing a red coat over a pair of nice slacks. That's what she calls them, slacks. It's always slacks unless she's going riding, and then they're dungarees. Neither is dressed in a way that would keep them warm if they had to wait outside. Everyone else is wearing regular clothes, hats, gloves, parkas, over long pants. Her own coat bears the symbol of an upscale company in the upper arm. A while ago, she put a piece of dark duct tape over it, hoping that perhaps people wouldn't notice. Today's the day, someone says. The moment is now, another man adds. Have you picked your turkey out yet? Her father asks one of the men. She notices he's guiding the small talk away from the events at hands and towards more generic seasonal chat. No, sir, the man says. This year, I'm going to visit my brother up by Seattle. Fine man you are, fine man. He's beaming. His excitement is palpable. Her father shakes hands, any hand he can get a hold of. You have to touch people. You have to look them in the eye and listen to what they have to tell you. You don't have to like it, but you have to listen. We used to have a word for it, decency. Nice to see you, her mother says to one of the women. And as they move around the room, both her mother and father greet strangers as though they've met them before. Good of you to come out, a man calls to them. When she was younger, going places with her parents used to make her feel special. People paid extra attention. She imagined herself as a princess. When she stops to think about it now, she's embarrassed. Her father moves with a kind of swagger, occupying space in a way that might make you think he is the candidate, but he's not. He's the machine. He's the thing that makes it go, the money. Bull in a china shop, her mother said when she was angry with him, and then she got defensive when Megan looked shocked. Well, you don't get rich being Mr. Nice Guy, her mother said, and left it at that. They'll be coming, she hears someone say, just before lunch and then at the end of the day. People are going to show up for sure. That's what they do when they have something to say. Some folks feel it's already been said, another man adds. Either way, shouldn't be optional, one of the man says. Folks don't like to be told what to do, someone adds in. You'd think they want as many people as possible to participate, another man says. A little naive, her father whispers. It's always interesting to hear what common people say. Why do you say common people, she asks. He looks confused. What should I say? Just people, she says. When you say common people, it sounds like you see yourself as different from everyone else. I am different, he says. I'm rich and proud of it. Common people should be glad to see me and happy when I buy their products and eat in their restaurants. It's a sign of my approval. Whose approval? My approval. And because you're rich, your approval means more than someone else's? If you were studying for a test, her father says, would you take advice from an A student or a C student? Is this a test, she asks. It's life, he says. It makes people feel bad, she says, like they're less than equal. It's not my job to make people feel equal, her father says. Well, are teachers less valuable than doctors? They get paid less, but without teachers, you wouldn't have doctors, Megan says. When I hear the word common, I hear Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man, her mother says. I attended a performance in New York years ago when you were just a baby. Her mother pauses. What's nice about a place like that, this, is that people are neighborly. They help out. It's the same folks who do everything from organizing the parades to the potlucks. They're the doers, her father says, as they move closer to the check-in table. Did you know that if you're 16, you can be an election judge? All it takes is a bona fide county resident, mentally competent, four days of training before the event. A little pecker schmecker who can't even tie his shoelaces can get up counting all of the votes and call it in. And they get paid. In a town that's not brimming with employment for children, it's not a bad deal. And then it's their turn. Her parents step up and sign the book. You can see their signatures from where they signed last time. She finds it curious that a person's signature doesn't change over the years. Is this your first time, Megan? The woman asks as she inscribes her name in the book. Yes. Do you know how it works? In theory, she says, but I do have a question. The woman nods. Do you know why it's on a Tuesday? The woman smiles. Well, I asked my husband the same thing last night. He had no idea, so I looked it up. Turns out that the Founding Fathers had something in mind. By November, the fall harvest was done, but the weather was still mild enough for travel. 
and because t folks used to have to travel in order to take part. They couldn't do it on a Monday because people wouldn't travel on the Sabbath, and it couldn't be November 1st because that's All Saints Day and some people care about that, and so on. She pauses. There's a line forming behind Megan. Anyway, that's what I learned. Do you know how the next part works? Not really. The woman hands Megan a paper form. You take this and go over to one of those booths and make your selections, and then you fold it over and bring the paperwork over here and drop it in that box. Easy peasy. The booths are mini stalls with cardboard side screen like blinders you'd put up to keep a kid from cheating on a test or to keep people from peeping over their neighbor's shoulder. That simple? That's the way we do it, the woman says. Well, how do you know who wins? Tonight when we close up, a few of us stay behind, open the boxes, and count them up. Is that what the 16-year-old does, Megan wonders? And then what? We get on the phone and we call the number in. When my granddad was a kid, they used to say, send the number via wire like an SOS to the state capitol. Megan is surprised at how rudimentary it seems, rinky-dink. She's not sure what she imagined, but it was definitely something more substantive, professional, modern, maybe like a big machine with lights, bells, and whistles, the kind of thing they have in arcades. She imagines matching the picture of the person you're supporting with their name, pushing the button, and then a lot of lights go off and it simultaneously registers on some great scorecard. <laughs> Score one for the red team! This is the paper form, the cardboard binders. It's, it's all beyond banal. All over the country, people are doing this exact same thing, and by late tonight, there'll be a new order in the land? It's more like an activity you do at school to pick the new head of class. She looks over and sees her parents carefully pushing their forms into the sealed box. Her father smiles. He's passing the torch. His deep pleasure in this process reminds her of all the things they've talked about over the years, the car trips and vacations to historical sites. This is the passion he shares. He doesn't talk about himself or his childhood. He talks about historical figures, battles, wars, treaties, and the three branches of government. She's been brought home to vote, to go on this electoral journey as a kind of indoctrination. She ducks into her little booth, fills out the form, folds as directed, and then hurries over and stuffs it into the box. On the way out, there's a table set up with an enormous industrial-sized coffee urn, glass bottles of milk, and a box of freshly gazed, glazed donuts, still shining where the sugar is drying. She picks up a donut. Her mother sees her do it and looks horrified. It's hard to know if it's the calories, the idea of a donut for breakfast, or the fact that it's been sitting out and possibly touched by others. She's caught. The donut pinched between her thumb and middle finger. The glaze begins to melt. She squeezes, denting the dough. As she's holding the donut, unsure of what to do, her father leans over and takes a bite. Best damn donut I ever had, he says. They had to be made within the last hour. I can taste it. The yeast is still rising. Her mother reaches over and plucks the donut from between Megan's fingers and drops it into a trash can. The expression on her mother's face is one of enormous satisfaction, like she's put out a fire. Megan is left with sticky fingers. She puts her hand in a pocket and thinks about what she may be able to do and when she might be able to sneak a lick. Well, that's all she wrote, Sonny, their driver says when they're back in the car. Our duty is done, her father says. And as soon as they're on the plane, her father turns to her and asks, so what did it feel like? She can't tell him that she finds the whole thing so deeply basic that it's causing her a new kind of anxiety, a deep existential ache that nothing is as previously represented, nothing in reality is as good as the idea she's been sold. She can't tell him any of it because she knows it would break his heart. Luckily, before she can came, say much, he continues. You know, back in Connecticut, we used to vote on a device that was gunmetal gray. You went in, pulled a little curtain around you like a photo booth, and toggled the switches, and then you pulled down an enormous level with a black handle to register your vote. Every time I threw that lever to the right, I felt like I was doing something major, starting a time machine or launching an atomic bomb. I was never sure which. I'm proud of you, he says. Getting yourself out here to cast your ballot means a lot to us. Thanks, Megan says. Men means a lot to me, too. We're making history one day at a time. I cast my vote in honor of all those who've come before me with an eye to the future ahead. Is that a line from a poem, her mother asks? No, she says. I just made it up. And that's where I'll stop for now. Um, and I'll just say it gets, it gets wilder from there. So, um, I'm happy to answer any questions or tell you more about the process of writing that book. I will also tell you that because, because it is a hometown crowd, um, I used to go to the polls at Rollingwood Elementary with my mom back in 1804. <laughs> and there was a donut. And the whole thing, <laughs> this whole book is about the donut. No, the whole book is not the whole book. There was a Krispy Kreme orange crawler that was so incredibly good that I had, I think it was 1968, when I did work for Humphrey Headquarters Jr. with Sarah Wattenberg, who's right there at the back of the room. We have the letter from uh, Vice President Humphrey thanking us for our service. 
Um, but there was this Krispy Kreme crawler there, and there it is again. So that, on the one hand, I will say, importantly, I really write fiction, and I don't write, unless I'm purposely writing autobiographic, autobiographically, but that's a good example of the way in which um, my own history does make itself into the story. So, anyway. uh, does anyone have a question or a thought? Do you remember the donuts? You missed the donuts. You know, I could have if I'd gotten ready. And then in high school, we used to get the Montgomery donut donuts, also for breakfast with a Coke, right? That was a good combo. It's guaranteed by math, you'd be asleep. Um, yeah, anyone question of any kind? I don't want to have to ask you guys questions. Yes, please. At, yeah, sure, come to the microphone, because there's, there's millions of people who are actually at home tonight. Um, <laughs> I don't know what. Fantasy Island was canceled, so they're watching us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so I know you usually write fiction, but I guess this book, it's kind of not fiction because it's the, the way the world is right now. And I was, I don't really know what my question is, but sure. I guess if you could comment on what it's like to write about reality. It, yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a very good question <laughs> um, and a very good observation. So on the one hand, this particular book, is also, it, it's in, in many ways, it takes place between November 2008 and January 2009. And it is filled with history, historical reference, fact, which is something we don't stick to anymore, but it is filled with all kinds of details um, that are true. And then as things were actually happening in our world and getting weirder and weirder, on the one hand, I kept thinking, do I push this story and this group of men known as the Forever Men further out, or how do I best talk about that evolution to the idea that um, basically that a lot of money can buy social media, can buy disinformation, can buy confusion, can also help to sow dissent or f fracture within a society, which are, these are not new ideas. I mean, they've occurred all through history. Um, and so I, I felt like on the one hand, I already knew what the story was I wanted to tell. And then I asked at one point a friend, the writer Jeanette Winterson, I said, you know, I'm writing this book, which on the one hand, is seems like nonfiction in some ways, but I'm not a historian, I'm not a political theorist. And she said, stick with the characters. And I thought, that's actually really good advice. So the book is as much about sort of the ideas that these guys are exploring as who they are as people. And there is an evolution of this main character, the big guy, who at a certain point begins to realize that maybe his relationships with his wife and his daughter are not really what he thought they were. And he has this sort of moment of, you know, what if, what if it turns out I'm a jerk? Um, which is, we all have those in little, you know, on small scales. And what do you do about that? And how do you live with yourself if it turns out, you know, if, you, if it turns out you're not a good person? So that for me was the sort of a, a big piece of the focus, was telling a very human story in addition to sort of a larger kind of cultural, philosophical, political story. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Super. Hey. Hello. Th that answer touches on a little bit of this. Sure. Um, I don't want to jump to any conclusions, but you worked for Humphrey, you're up in Chevy Chase, you're writing about conservatives from Wyoming. How do you do that? How, is it research? Is it people yeah. you've met? Is it your imagination? How Keep do you know those characters? Um, that's also a super good question. And I would say, so I really, I often pick what I would describe as the least likely characters in a way to, to tell a story. And so in this case, I would say underlying the thread of what I saw happening since um, Obama's election was that on the one hand, the election of a black man to the president was very scary for white men in power. And it felt to me like it unleashed a sort of, I mean, a, a torrent of racism and sexism that has always been under the surface, but that it became amplified in some ways. Um, so who better to tell that tale than, than these old white men who are like agitated? Um, that's half a joke, but half not a joke, because I really very much like to inhabit characters that are not me. That's the fun of writing fiction. But then the question is, how do you do it and how do you do it well? And I would say it's a combination of um, research. I do a lot. I do do a lot of research and a lot of reading. Um, I also know people who are not unlike these people. Um, people always say to me, am I supposed to like these people? And I think it's not for me about liking a character. It's about finding their humanity, realizing that we're all complex people so a person can be a good father can be a good person and still do terrible things. That's complicated for all of us. But I think if we think about our own lives, we've all known versions of people like that. So 
it did leave me. I do have one good billionaire joke that I did. It's not in the book that I did gather along the way. So this is a true, this is a true story of a billionaire joke. So a billionaire is at a party with a bunch of people who are not billionaires and they're, you know, making s'mores. It's the end of like a 4th of July barbecue. And they're all going around saying what they would do if they had a million dollars. So, you know, one person's like, if I had a million dollars, I would like buy my mom a house. If I had a million dollars, I'd pay off all my college debt. If I had a million dollars, I would, you know, open a bookstore, um, all these things. They get to the billionaire and he goes, if I had a million dollars, I'd fucking kill myself. <laughs> Meaning that he'd lost all his money. Um, that's a billionaire joke. Um, so I would say it's a combo of all of those things. Um, and, and really trying to, to spend time, I, I firmly believe in, in, you know, trying to understand people other than myself and experiences other than my own. I'm not, I'm not much of a naval contemplator. I have one, I think. Um, but you know, not my thing. Anyone else have questions? Yeah, please. Um, your book seems really timely, not just to explain the present, but that right now there seems to be several books coming out trying to understand how we got to the present. I'm thinking of Jonathan Lemire and mm -hmm. Dana Milbank, exactly, journalists, yeah. yes. and who, their narratives, I think Lemire goes back to Newt Gingrich and the contract of America in 1993. Mm -hmm. You go back in your story to the, the election of Obama and you're doing it in fiction. And so my question is, yeah. is what does fiction allow you and the reader to understand about we, where we've come to, how we've come to where we are, perhaps differently than a nonfiction account? That's such a super good question. I'm gonna write that down. Um, <laughs> make people ask me that all the time. No, I think that that's a really good question. And I'll say that as much as mine sort of goes back to Obama's election in 2008, it also in some ways goes back to the end of Eisenhower's um, presidency and that the famous, the rise of the military industrial complex speech, because I think that's where the seeds of big money coming into politics really were. And even, even in the early 90s, if you put $100,000 in, you could get whatever you wanted, but then by, you know, after Obama's election in 2008, it became like $100 million you had to put in. And now the guy, is it, uh, the, guy, the guy the other day, Leo, the Federalist Society guy, Leo Leonard, is that his last name? I don't want to get it wrong, but it might. Um, I think he put in like $1.8 billion the other day. It's just like billion, billion, billion. yeah. Um, yeah, with the big B. Um, and so that's super interesting to me. So the question is, how does fiction help us understand anything differently? I would say, Fiction can get at a kind of emotional and psychological truth that in a way I think social historians do when they talk about the threads that come together. But I feel like when I look at a lot of the, the political history written from that time period, I don't feel like it, in it really talks about the fear that a lot of people felt, even though I think that fear has driven a lot of things like January 6th and the need to kind of reclaim things. I don't think that in some ways it is il illustrative of the racial panic I would describe, or, you know, in this, I mean, the, the rise of the incredible sort of sexism and they need to kind of reclaim women's rights. It's like, I'm sorry, we're having a kind of a freak out. We just want to just take back your rights because that's the easiest thing for us to do today. Um, and we'll, we'll talk to the rest of you tomorrow. It's like a bad day at school. You're like, you know, recess is canceled um, and is, so is lunch. So does that sort of answer it? But I feel like fiction has, by using characters and by taking them through, um, exploration of their own life and their own actions. It, it just is illustrative of another element of it, which in a way gets sometimes left out of history where we're documenting events rather than almost cultural psychological evolution, if that makes some sense. You'll have to tell me how it fits up with the other two. Yeah. Yeah. Other folks? I knew there was a hard question coming. Okay. Getting ready. It's going to be a fastball. <laughs> Uh, I yes. hope not. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I was just wondering, since you said you had already been like, writing this book for a while, yeah. by the time we got to like where you know January six, what your experience was during the like most recent lame duck period, and um, if it kind of makes you remember other similar periods differently, like during the most recent time I was reading, um, I forget the name, but it's uh, it was a book that was set during like the Bush v Gore mm -hmm. period, so that that was kind of like I forgot how weird that. I mean, I was right. really young at the time, right. but I was like, oh, this isn't like 
super abnormal. This is weird for a lot of people. And right. I was kind of thinking like maybe, especially in light of your book now, thinking there's probably a group of people who felt the same way in 2008 that it was equally weird. Absolutely. And yes, I mean, in, in different ways. So the, and, and the book does make a little bit of reference to, to the Bush v. Gore where we went to bed thinking that Al Gore was going to be the president. And we woke up and we're like, uh-oh. And then there was this guy named Hanging Chad that we never met before who was like lived in Florida. I'm like, hey, I'm like, you know, what's up? And he's like, nothing. I'm just hanging, tying things up. So I think that was very much a piece of it. And, and that, to me, was an illustration of the way in which the Republican Party did assert itself and really claimed that election, right? And because they had that power within Florida, they were able to really do that pretty easily. Um, I think that there's a sort of a bad joke in this book where they talk about when Obama wins, they don't have that trick or any similar trick available to them. And so the big guy and his friends are all the more angry because it proves how much they've lost their control and their authority. Um, and absolutely all through history, these things do sequentially happen. I will say, you know, when January 6th happened, um, I find all of it truly horrifying, honestly. And I think that one of the things that's been interesting is we're at a point now where there really has been a divide between what we believe to be fact and reality and truth. And then, you know, when Kellyanne Conway said early on there are these alternative facts, which meant, in theory, it would be good for my people, fiction writers, but all of a sudden there became a fiction of things, and, and a fiction of things that bears little relationship to things that can be proven, and yet people are believing them, subscribing to them, acting on them. And it also meant that many things that had never been legislated that were just, as the big guy would say, sort of decency or the idea of this is how somebody behaves. Like, when you leave the White House, don't take the yellow folders. <laughs> you know, uh, Just basic stuff. Like, don't put them in with the photos. Um, that hadn't really been overtly legislated because no one was like taking the yellow folders before. So all of those things kind of are thrown out the window and it's, and it's, it's kind of literally becomes a spiral because then the question becomes, well, if it wasn't legislated before, how do you reprimand, punish, grab it back, and make sure it doesn't happen again? And all as that's still happening, we're in this other weird thing, which I'm sure many of you know. You know, when you Google something, the answer you get is based on what Google already knows about you. That's why if you look on, if you put in something on one person's computer, same information on another person's computer, two different answers. But not like what time is it? Okay, <laughs> but that's a good example. Like it could be, you know. Um, well, and depending on where the computer thinks you are in time, but you are delivered information based on what the, you know, the algorithms know about your interests. Like the other day, I, and I, I'm practicing tweeting because the publisher says you should tweet more. So the other day I tweeted, I said, what does it mean where I'm getting ads for luxury apocalypse bunkers and underwear you can pee or bleed into at your will, <laughs> like, you know, at any quantity apparently. And I was like, what is that? To, what, like, what world are we living in where that's come? Like, I'm getting like, hi, happy birthday, happy whatever. And like, buy a bunker in like, you know, Wyoming and buy underwear that you can, you know, whatever you can. I don't know. It's like live work underwear or something. Um, so I think that's all very interesting, but it's clearly based on some algorithm of, you know, what me and my child are looking at, which are two very different stages of life. Um, so I find that really interesting. And I think it's a kind of also a problem because it happens and we don't know that it's happening. It's not like you're aware of it every time you Google something, right? You don't think, oh, I'm getting, you know, it's the same as also your streaming service, right? Just for you, <laughs> you know, exactly, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think, it's, I think it's all interesting. And I'm really, honestly, a little anxious about where, where we go from here. I have some more notes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I, I don't wanna like put them into effect yet. Yeah, it's scary, yeah. Ask a second question because okay. you mentioned Wyoming. Why did you choose Wyoming? Yeah. Did you have any sense of who Liz Cheney was going to be when you chose Wyoming? Yeah. And I might want the reference for the underwear ads. Yeah. Just I think it's called Finks <laughs> or Thanks. I'm not really sure. It depends on how dyslexic you are. It, exactly. it sounds um, appealing. Yeah. It Why Wyoming? Yeah. Why Wyoming? So Wyoming. That's a again a really good question. There's there is a ton of sort of fact in here. So Wyoming was based on research. Uh, I believe that the tax rate in Wyoming is low or nil. Um, it is a place where, where very wealthy people buy large tracts of land. Um, and then, you know, I'll put this stuff in, and then funny enough, like in the last couple of weeks, there's like was a big article in either the Post or the New York Times about the wealthy people buying up Wyoming. And also, it's a place where we have missile bunkers and stuff like that too. Um, 
so that was sort of the why Wyoming. I did not see the Liz Cheney thing coming, but it is interesting to me because part of the big guy, and the big guy is quite enamored with Dick Cheney, which I find humorous. Um, and the big guy believes that Megan, his daughter, once he realizes that he's first like lamenting that he doesn't have a son or a successor, and then he realizes, oh wait, I have this other thing. It could be almost as good. Um, and as he's realizing he has this really kind of great kid, he believes that she will follow in his footsteps, which really is in some ways, oh my God, the rise of Liz Cheney. But at the same time, the Liz Cheney that we've seen recently is kind of like amazing. You're like, Liz Cheney, where did you come from? And they think, well, we know where you came from, so how did you, like, what happened? Um, but I find it super interesting. I, I mean, it's, it's, and also the ways in which people that, for some of us, we might have been put off by five years before. You're like, Mitt Romney, great guy, love him, you know. Um, different people, you all of a sudden are like, that's an interesting or viable person to me because the extremes are getting more and more extreme, and that's super scary. And they also, as the extremes become more and more extreme, they also become more ahistorical. So we have a lot of people who are either running for office and unfortunately some who are in office who have no awareness of history. So no context, no framing, no idea of what came before or even how history or politics or government literally works, which also means that you can play at fiction because there are no rules. So that's complicated. But Wyoming was a, a research decision. <laughs> And I've never been there. And I've never been to Phoenix. And there's a lot about, that's the hotel in Phoenix don't. where McCain's campaign was and also where they married. Don't go. Don't go? I know. Uh, you are scared. <laughs> yeah. And I'm scared. Exactly. Okay. That's why I we're know, here together. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, what are you doing? Uh, well, I'm writing something, which is what all stupid people who put words down on paper do when they're scared. Right. Okay. And, but mine is nonfiction. Or I suppose it could be fiction. It's political <laughs> Remains theory. Remains to be seen, right? Yeah, well, exactly. no, it's political theory, yeah. so it's hard yeah. to tell. Um, so are you intending to write more now that the world has really gone bananas? Right. I'm not sure. You know, I found this book in some ways hard to write because I really, there's also a piece of it where I depend on our world and our society to be stable so that I can go off in my imagination and think of weird things. I don't like it when it gets weird in reality because then I'm like, uh-oh, and I have to just watch TV and go, uh-oh, uh-oh. Um, and I feel like for, you know, I had non sequitur, but a friend came to visit and I watch TV a lot at night. And I, and I watch the news like round the clock. And the friend goes, is this what you do every night? <laughs> I was like, yeah. And she was like, it would make me feel really bad. <laughs> like, I would want to hurt myself. I was like, we can change the channel like anytime you want. But that was interesting. But I feel like I felt the obligation to sort of show up for news, for fact, and so on. So the question also for me is a little bit, if, if I was to write something that went beyond where this book ends, would I pick up right where it ends? And the answer is probably not, because that piece has already been written in some ways, so from 2009 till now. But I might think about who Megan has become and what happens to those big guys. Um, maybe. Yeah. And by the way, it's good that you're writing because, you know, that's also, that's like, that's the way you could fight with the pen, which is both, the big pens are cheaper than guns and they're also just, you know, they're just better. Yeah. I also think about that because I think the Repu yeah, the Republicans have a lot of guns and I think Democrats don't have guns, so like, what's the war? Sorry. <laughs> you know, it's like, Right? I mean, just saying. Yeah. There's nicenews.com now that makes me feel better. My girlfriend told me about it. She said it's all over. There's what? There's a thing out there now. Like the puppy videos? All these nice news. Nice news, right. Yeah. It's much better to hear before you go to bed. Yeah. NiceNews.com. I mean, I think, th yes, there, it's, it is nice to hear lovely, like, human interest stories of rescued pets and so on. And we, does anyone else get those threads of all the, like, you know, the duck rescuing the lion or something? It's like, come here, lion, it's okay. And Yeah, I do like all that. But I feel an obligation, I mean, not to be weird, to, to be attentive and in reality and to try to sort of, it's interesting, too, because I look at fiction as, as something that, on the one hand, it, it needs to be entertaining, it needs to be funny, but it also needs to provoke a conversation, and I want to have that conversation, and I feel like that's somehow part of my job. 
which is not as much fun as nicenews.com. But um, anyone else have a question? No. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here. It's so nice to see people I've known since I was like four or before um, <laughs> in the front row. Um, and I'm happy to sign books or answer any individual questions like, you know, that you might have. And just really thank you, thank you. I deeply appreciate it. <laughs>